All right, everybody, thank you for joining us here today. We're going to have a conversation with John White and Brad Peterson. So let me just bring them in right away. And um, John White is a partner at Harness IP, and uh, Brad is a partner now newly at Barnes & Thornburg. We are, just had the um, patent prosecution program concluded. You might hear a little bit of noise in the background that's folks having lunch. We're here today to kind of talk about, sort of wrap up the program, if you will, and talk about uh, a specific topic that is near and dear to both of their hearts, which came up repeatedly during the program here t over the last two days, which is means plus function claiming. Uh, and I know all of you have been told by your law professors and by all people who are extreme thought leaders and they know better than anybody else, never use means plus function claiming. Well, I have to tell you, every single program that I do, and this last patent prosecution program was no exception, everybody wants means plus function. The litigators want means plus function. And what was surprising to me, and I'd like to get you guys to comment on this, is um, all of the in-house people who spoke about means plus function claiming said, hey, well, give me means plus function. Now, not only means plus function, but where are the means plus function? So, Brad, this is a this is a conversation near and dear to your heart. Um, first, what were your thoughts when you were hearing all of these people talk about what, what you and I and John have been saying you should be doing for years? It was refreshing to hear the well, kind of the continuation of what has always been a cyclical love hate relationship with means plus function as far as the patent community is is concerned because uh, you get the vagaries of the different court decisions that have come on in the time and I think certainly right around the turn of the century with Warner Jenkins and then with Festo there was a lot of shade being thrown at means plus function as claiming styles and the result of that was just the general guidance uh, it's a lot of extra effort and probably not worthwhile because you've got all of these now constraints on what kind of zone of equivalence you might be granted if you go after that. So I think it fell out of favor, but it wasn't the first time that it had fallen out of favor. I don't think it'll be the last. <laughs> uh, no, but these things seem to come around. Right? They do. They loop around. Uh, so, so John, what were, what were your thoughts uh, when you were hearing all these people say what, what you and I, we. And people who know us, I mean, you, you were the best man at my wedding, and <laughs> we've been teaching Patent Bar Review together for 24 years. There's been some summers I've spent much more time with you than with Renee. I mean, so right. we know, <laughs> can finish each other's sentences almost. And I know that this was music to your ears hearing this, you know, because the bad advice that these academics give about means plus function is really detrimental. Well, it's this absolutist advice. It's well, there, there's a court decision, and because of it, we must change our way of life and our way of thinking and disregard the statute and all that sort of stuff. And you just have to look at the cases and that are the res, you know that result in this advice to know that that's not really what the case said. The specification was so thin as to be translucent. And people were taking uh, claim language and trying to latex it to cover all kinds of stuff. And the court said, you know, you didn't disclose it, so it can't be within the scope of your claim, and we don't care when this claim is interpreted. At the time of filing, no statutory equivalence, or doctrine of equivalence, after the fact. You didn't even think of this at all when you were writing this claim, and so the claim can't cover that. And so. You know, I love means plus function claiming, uh, and it's easy for a jury to understand. You know, it's it's a it's a great thing. It it is, and not only is it easy for the jury, it's easy. They're easy to write, and I, I forget exactly what year it was when I I woke up and, and got out of the haze of all of the you know the don't ever do it, don't ever do it. And you get enough experience on your own, and you say, well, well, why is why is I mean, I don't think any absolute rules really work in patent prosecution. Number one. Mm. Because uh, you're supposed to be claiming something that's new to begin with, so <laughs> it's got you got to be creative, right? And the the other thing too is is I've never in my career had a client come up to me and say, write as many claims as you can, cover the full breadth and scope that you've disclosed. And I started thinking to myself, well, you know, 
if you use at least a couple of these, then you're guaranteed to get at least the full scope of what you've disclosed. Yeah. And I just never understood why they were saying don't use it. I mean, I get you d don't use it if you have a thin spec, but where I woke up was when Mark Lemley started, you know, and Mark is, he's misunderstood, I think. He is a extremely good lawyer, very, very good lawyer, very persuasive. And he started writing articles about what disclosure was necessary in software applications. Mm -hmm. And it basically, I interpreted it as saying, and I don't know that he actually said this, but I read and I kind of, my eyes open. This means plus function interpretation of the, of the, of the spec is going to, at some point, apply to every software patent, whether you're using that claim language or not. And I thought to myself, so why not use it then? Mm -hmm. Brad, go ahead. Well, his 2013 article was really kind of one of the seminal changes in the swing of direction on means plus function from my kind of historical perspective looking back on it. And that, that's kind of, it's been about every decade you kind of go to, uh, okay, are we at a lull? Are we at the apex of our cycle of what you're going to be using it for? But, you know, what came out of the seminar was certainly, this is not the be all end all only kind of claim. Right. And the full spectrum of claim types and claim scopes and disclosure and even claiming in provisional applications with claim sets included in there so that you're not paying for what you're actually trying to say are the scope of the claims relevant to the invention. I think that's what you're kind of going to see here is for the cases that you can afford and that you predict will matter in the future, there's going to be a divergence between are you really trying to protect trespass by someone else or are you really just being limited to patents that are covering a potential theft of your invention? Yeah. And that's part of the difference that we saw, I think, a lot from the speakers was really wanting to understand what is the business or what is the inventor trying to do with this asset that you're helping them acquire. Right, right, right. Well, I want to come back to the trespass idea because there was a few speakers in a few different panels picked up on what you said because you, you, your panel was, I think, like the third panel. Was, it was early in the event. Um, but, but, John, one of the things that I thought your panel, maybe it's just fresh because it was just this morning. It was brilliant. Jim. It was brilliant. And <laughs> of course. The, but there were a couple of things that people have already come up to me and said, you know, I wrote this down, and it was when Cynthia... Deal Mitchell said, what, what, I just want everything. I, I want, it, I want, I want uh, attorneys and outside counsel who, are, who understand that what I need is everything. Mm -hmm. Now, and if you, if you focus on that quote and take it out of context, it's unrealistic. But what she was saying was, my job as an in-house counsel is to predict what's going to happen 10 years from now. And you can talk about why that number matters as well. But... I don't know what's going to matter. I don't know what claiming structures are going to be in vogue 10 years from now when this becomes a relevant asset. So give me everything. Give me a couple of each of these. And if, you know, and I think it was enough, I need another application to do this, then let's talk about that. I need everything. I don't need you to pick and choose the lane based on yesterday's federal circuit case. Right. And, and, uh See, means plus function gives you, uh, it takes your claim uh, scope to the limit of what your specification discloses, plus sort of a fuzziness around the edges. You know, what's reasonably understood from one of ordinary skill in the art. And so when she says, give me everything, she simply means get what I'm entitled to based on the limit of my specification. Take it right to the edge. And of course, I want other claims too. But why this is so fundamental when you're in business is you can't articulate to a C-level person, well, we didn't get a patent on exactly that. You know, they, they think of patents conceptually. We got the patent on that. And if you then have to, uh, you know, give a qualifier, well, n not really. We, we got the implemented with, with this technology at this speed, at this, you know, it's like. And because this Federal Circuit panel yeah, said uh, that. And they begin to look at yeah. you like, what am I paying you for? I mean, we, we don't have the patent on that fill-in concept. And you go, well, well, no, not exactly. Rather, you should say, yes. 
because we used at least a handful of means plus function claims that get us right to what you think we've protected. Indeed, we have. Whether those claims will stand up in 10 years is another matter, but by God, we have a patent on it. And I'm telling you that right here, right now, means plus function. Whereas with other claims, you can't really say that. You go, well, we claim this structure, this execution, and if somebody imitates that, we got them. Well, aren't there other ways to do it? Well, yeah. Well, what the heck? Right. <laughs> so, well, what have you done? It, it, I thought we got a patent. You know? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, the, the interesting thing, too, that came up about uh, in the, the one panel we had yesterday afternoon, our last panel, it was um, one, one, we had a multiple just all corporate panels. And this was one of the all corporate panels. And it, it, I thought it was ingenious during our pre call, it came up, and again, it came up during the panel is you have to talk to your salespeople, you have to talk to your marketing <laughs> exactly. people, you have to talk to your business development people to find out what it is is that, is that fill in the blank. Well, those people are the need. ones out there saying, well, we have a patent on that. And, and you don't want somebody to be able to parse that and say, well, I don't think so. You know, you want to be able to say, I think so, and I can say so. Right, right. And, and they also know the direction the clients want to go in. And they may not, Brad, they may not understand the importance or relevance of it from a patent perspective. But if you don't talk to them, you're missing great insights. Yeah, and I always call it, there are two different tests for two different audiences. When you go to the company or you go to the startup or the inventors, there's cute, and you go to the engineers and they will tell you how to do this cute. And that will involve all of the little particular bells and whistles and steps and elements of equipment that they use to accomplish it. And then you go to the marketing folks and you find out sexy <laughs> because that's where the money is. Right. And this is ultimately insurance for profits. So you want to understand what is the potential <laughs> profit that this patent is directed to in, and, and to how protect. do we, how do we get there? Right. Exactly. I, I don't know whether you were in the room during that panel, but I brought up the, what was it, a soldering iron that we yes, have? Yes, example. our famous soldering uh, and, iron. And, and mini exam number six, which yes. like 50,000 people have probably taken now that right. John wrote that years ago. There's this series of claim examples to teach them what they might get on the exam, right? And uh, is, they're easy questions. They're, they're, it's like, oh, well. Uh, pick pick the design patent claim, or you know what what do what do you need to cover this? You know, and it's like trigger words in the question or ornamental design. You know, so it's still we're we're, we're teaching them right, but there's one question in that series that is extremely insightful from a business and patent perspective. It talks about how that well taking away this particular one feature and designing it with a different feature actually lowers the cost but the perceived value is higher. <laughs> so, so you need to protect it. And, and, and I wonder whether you could ever possibly know that if you're not talking to your marketing and salespeople. No, and it's what, you know, when you talk to the C-suite folks, I wanna say, we're going after patent protection for your franchise features, because it's the franchise. Right. That's the thing right. that shoves the competitors into a disadvantageous space of the competitive market that they're in. And you know everybody thinks that it's always about blocking. Oh my, I'm not gonna let you into this market and we've got a walled gate around it and this is where it's at. But oftentimes you actually get better value by shoving them into this disadvantageous corner. Right. Costlier to produce, less efficient, more noisy, whatever the particulars are yeah. of the invention that you're at. And you can accomplish just as much for the C-suite folks to get a shoving patent as opposed to a blocking patent. So, and that was interesting on your panel. Again, Gary started mentioning, he's like, when he was, I think, he didn't say, but I think it was when he was maybe, well, I won't mention the company. It was because he's gone, he's been in the corporate world for a number of years. But in one of those companies that he was working for did not have protection on the core thing that they were selling. <laughs> but what they story. had was protection all the way around it. Yeah. You know, so people would then look at that and assume that they couldn't get in, but they knew they didn't have protection on the thing that they were actually selling. And it sounded like maybe they couldn't have gotten that protection. I'm not sure whether they couldn't have gotten it or they didn't get it, but the strategy of patenting all the way around it scared them off from ever trying to do that. I mean, but these are higher end strategies. Um, John, how often does that do you engage those kind of 
clients with those strategies? Well, uh, one uh, client that we both uh, uh, taught at, and again, I won't mention any names, but their ambition is to as rapidly as possible get into the white space between patents of others in uh, uh, 5G, 6G, you know, whatever the coming standards are, so that they have a role to play in SEP. You know, it, and, and yes, they're brilliant people, they're doing a lot of inventing, but a primary ambition of theirs is they're all PhDs and they reflexively realize what's left out and they go get it and right. call it their own. And so that is what I was thinking of when Gary was saying, well, we couldn't get that, but we could get all the space around it. And this kept people away. And I thought, you know, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, because that's what that company said. They're trying, I envision them as trying to get in and create a wedge. Yes. You know, so now we've, we've, you missed this. You, I read what you did. I saw this. I saw, and you left this out. Let me get that slice. Uh, so now I can build on that and be relevant, and then you're going to need what I have. It's the seat at the table. Right. You know, yeah. What do patents get? A seat at the table of the future. And if yeah. that's what they're doing, they're creating their own leverage to have that seat. Yeah. yeah. And and we took, I, I was really amazed at all the strategy type stuff that came out. And and even even more happy to hear that, you know, we had a, 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 lot, of, a lot of companies, a lot of people here from companies that are seem very sophisticated and maybe it's self-selecting you know maybe the companies that don't get it don't come to something like this but um i i was heartened to hear that you know the the best practices actually do exist <laughs> the stuff that we preach some people are doing yeah it's get, it's getting in there there's some there i mean you know my story on that is not the uh, patenting around but how do you patent the franchise yeah and it was a scary proposition i ended up eventually going in-house with this client uh, had an opportunity to do that in the 90s. But I talked to the marketing people and the C-suite people and I said, you know, so what's great about your invention? Well, we get to implant this defibrillator up here rather than in the stomach. So it's the fact that it's small. Go patent the fact that it's small. Yeah, not, not that it's here rather than here. It's, it's small. Yeah. And so I patented an implantable defibrillator having a volume of less than 90 cc's. Well, there you go. And that claim was allowed and generated almost $100 million in licensing fees when it was eventually enforced. The company, startup, eventually didn't make it. But, but they yeah. were able to recover yeah. because right. they had this IP that has having a seat at the table all of the other implantable defibrillator companies in the world at the time are licensed to that portfolio. Right. And right. Uh, well, well, we had to see another story like that during the program where um, where Matt said at his company they uh, he was talking with the salespeople and marketing people, and he knew that there was uh, some interest in a particular technology, and that there might be opportunities to you know partner or merge, license whatever. So he then took what they were doing and went track one with it. Hmm. And the day that due diligence was going on uh, was the day that he got the track one allowance. So that takes one question off the table. And you know, he, had, he admitted that he thought that the deal probably would have gotten done. We gotten done for a different price. Yep. You know, and, um, and so the, these types of strategies work. Now I wanna come back to what you were saying, Brad, about um, the trespass. You know, can you explain your, your thought process there and what, what you mean by that? Well, it kind of comes, and John and I were talking about this earlier at lunch, the concept of theft is a, it doesn't matter what audience you're at, it, it's what visceral. jurisdiction, it's visceral. Yeah. We know that that's wrong. A jury and a judge know that that's wrong. Mm -hmm. The concept of trespass, which is are you inside of the claim scope or outside of the claim scope, is a much, much more abstract theory. And as a result of that, it turns out that actually there's a damages expert that I had worked with in the past, had a, his own theory about why Texas was a good venue. What? Because the folks in Texas generally have had experience or know someone who has mineral rights or oil rights. Yeah, everybody, especially in West Texas. Right? In West Texas in particular, <laughs> and so the and idea also not of a royalty. Right, and they're not afraid of big numbers because they're they, used to oil right. costing a lot. Exactly, and they understand that 
where your oil well is relative to your property is what matters on whether or not you get that check. So the concept of a trespass theory is more innate to the general populace's understanding in that part of the country. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, and people who don't know, they, they, West Texas and Eastern District of Texas both get, get unfair rap in the press because they're like, plaintiffs just go there and they win big money. Well, plaintiffs can go there and they can win big money, but more often than they win big money, they win nothing. So the, these people are also not rube, so you, a patent owner is going to pull the wool over their eyes. If you don't have the goods, you're not getting anything. Right. right. Um, so, so that's a very interesting theory. So let, let's come back to means plus function because I know that we wanted to talk about that and maybe you know, we can st start to wrap up and end on, on that note. How does good means plus function strategy play into you know, all the different things we talked about, the best practices, the, the giving your client you know, a variety of assets, uh, giving the litigator a variety of uh, arrows in the quiver. Uh, John, Brad, John, well, you want to go first? You know, my uh, the way I, I can, you know, support reasonable scope for means plus function is simply talking to the inventors, say, okay, let's nail down what you've got, the variations of it. Okay, let's put that to one side. You're now the competitor who's facing that. Let's go through everything you can do to do what that's doing without doing what that's doing. Okay? And I include that too. Yeah. And means plus function then takes you right to the limit of the embodiments that are most advantageous and all those that aren't. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's how you get there. You, you, it's a thoughtful specification. It is not speculation. And we were talking about that because some people think, oh, I know, I'll get broad scope for means plus function. I'll include pages of boilerplate speculation about <laughs> what this life science thing can do. And people see right through it. They go, oh, I see. So this is a great patent. It is. And this, uh, the first eight pages are identical to the 20 others you filed in the preceding six months. Is that correct? Oh, well, I, I guess it is. I, I, I didn't really check it on the word processor when I cut and pasted it. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so you didn't really invent anything here. You're just speculating that this effect may have some uh, yeah. knock-on effect in a seed, in a... Yeah, 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 well, yeah, it's complete speculation. That's not good for means plus function. Yeah, well, you know what I think of boilerplate. You know, <laughs> I, I just, this is supposed to be new. It's supposed to be innovative. Boilerplate is anti-new, and it's anti-innovative. And the other thing, too, is I hate an, uh, incorporation by reference, right? Because a big issue, and well, this is a different conversation for another day. We just put a pin in this. But an increasingly big issue is, you know, you said X to the EPO, and now you're saying why to the patent office, what's going on, you're committing fraud, when well, we all know that that may or may, may not be true, and it may, yeah, I did say X over there, and now I'm saying Y, because the science has changed. <laughs> you know, we found out that X is not right. So I'm, I'm not, I didn't lie, I didn't lie either time, I'm being accurate, you know, there's all kinds of reasons for that. But when you start just incorporating by reference seems to be like a go-to, where I'm just lazy, it's even more lazy than cutting and pasting, <laughs> and you have no idea what you've put in there. So I don't like that at all, And I, it, but it, this costs money, Brad. All of this costs money. It costs money, and we've talked about, you know, the 1980s when you and I started in this profession, <laughs> price for patent applications. But we didn't look any different, did we? We still young, vigorous. Oh, oh same yeah. as now. We were totally excited about coming into this profession. <laughs> so, no, you guys look the same, but my hair <laughs> is really, right. really we thin. Look the same. I need to go. No, no, you I, just go the no I know, hair. I need to go shave, Gene, shave hair. You know, and we I'll have a certain... And coif. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I don't know when we're gonna get this published, but I am getting my hip replaced next Tuesday, and I do plan to go. You know, while I'm recovering, there will be no hair on my head. <laughs> it's we'll scary see. the first time. It's we'll, like, we'll, wait a minute, what's underneath there? We'll, we'll see there? how no. it looks. But. Yeah, but when we started, but go ahead. I digress. When we started, the cost of cases were. Well, 
five thousand dollars ish, give or take ish. You'd see some at three. Yeah. You'd see some at eight. I wrote one for. 10 or 15, which was... That was know, the exception. It was the exception to the rule, and yeah. there would be ranges like that. And now you come out with the request for a proposal and the fee structures that are doing, and you know, what I would say is the saving grace may be most of those advanced companies that are coming out with fee structures grade their applications. Yes, mm -hmm. A, B, C, or A, B, C, right. one, two, three, and, whatever, yeah. You know, if you split the A's and say, okay, I want to recover potentially on a trespass theory, then you can get the work and the money you need to do the work to do a good job on those cases. And just set the expectation with the client that if it's a C case, this is a, we're just picture claiming this. If somebody steals this invention and you can have right. a story mm -hmm. of theft, you got a good path. Right. So if not, you know, you're not yeah. going to be able to remodel this 10 years down the road yeah. and have great yeah. success. Well, in the C's, I think, if you're, to the extent that they're worthwhile going for, they're essentially a design patent with a few paragraphs. I, I mean, it would be nice if the <laughs> U.S. Good. had utility model like we had in China, because that's yeah. really what you're trying we, to get. We, we talked right. utility models at lunch, you know, that it was a question of origination and uh, ownership, and if you could assert both of those, you're done. So, yeah, yeah. you know, and we're gonna have a panel uh, at Live, and one of the women who's from Peru, she wanted to talk about uh, utility models. So mm -hmm. we're gonna have a panel on what's going on in, in South America and strategies and that sort of thing. And she's gonna talk about utility models, and at least in Peru, and I don't know whether this is true or everywhere, but the damages for a utility model are the same mm -hmm. as the damages for an invention well, patent. And we talked about that because it's theft. You see, right. when you get that's exactly down right. to and that's that, that's why she's getting it. it it's, you're stealing it. Right, right. Yeah. And, and that's what she tells people. If you're in an industry and you have a competitor, you need this is a viable option because it's a, it guards against theft. Theft. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's your own manufacturer making it in the next shift for your competitor. That, that's right. the utility and, model protection yeah. you want. And you forgetting know? to take your trademark and off. And forgetting to take your marks <laughs> off of it. I mean, yeah, it's... it's right. Uh, so um, uh, that's another conversation for another, another day. But right. um, I, the, before we do wrap up, the w one thing I want to ask is, you know, so Amgen is now, it's, I think it's less than a month old, but it's around a month old, whatever mm. it is, you know, it's three aging. weeks old. You know, well, I don't think that's going to age well. That's my prediction. Mm -hmm. And everybody tells me I'm wrong. But um, I, I, every time I make a prediction, it turns out to be right. You know, in retrospect, you know, they told me Alice was no big deal. And I'm like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't until the CAFC and district courts got a hold of it. See, and that's the problem. You know, like when, <laughs> I read these, here. when, I, when I read these Supreme Court cases, I'm not reading them to say, okay, well, that what, what they said is terrible. I'm reading them with a, how are the people that are going to decide the bulk of these cases oh, at man. the PTAB and district court and CAFC going to interpret it? And when I look at Amgen, I look at the facts, because what the Supreme Court said was not bad. The problem they is... They only said Monopoly once, Jim. They only said Monopoly once, which <laughs> don't get me started on that, because that'll take a half hour to go through. I said, it's not, Corsic, what are you doing? Not a Monopoly. <laughs> not a Monopoly. <laughs> Patents Monopoly, God. no. If you people are that stupid. I, <laughs> no. It's we, not a Monopoly. You, you can't have a Monopoly... <laughs> Oh, no. when, when other people <laughs> have the right to, to block you and take your business away and mm -hmm. and your invention is fragile and it's I mean it's it's just please stop with the monopoly Supreme Court please because you're wrong you're <laughs> embarrassing you're, wrong. Yourself. you're embarrassing yourself you're embarrassing yourself <laughs> but where was I going with oh Amgen so, <laughs> oh that's right so, we were I, talking about I just that. thought I'd throw yeah. monopoly out there yeah, and see what happens throw you a bone <laughs> yeah <laughs> So, squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> I know it's like it's like my dogs when a squirrel shiny goes object, or a bird. Object. It's like you know, okay. in any event. So Amgen, I read that and I mm. know the facts of the case where they filed a 400-page application, mm. 26 examples, a CD-ROM worth of data, and the Supreme Court said, "Well, that's not enough." They didn't tell us what is enough, but that volume was not enough. Now, whether that is true or not, and I don't think that that's true based on the testimony that was at trial. I think they ignored the evidence to say what they wanted to say. That decision seemed to me that that decision could have been written a year ago after they took the case without ha having any information about the case yeah. Um, yeah. because they, they ignored the evidence. That, that's true. But what I think is going to be used in the way I would use it if I was challenged, if I was like, you know, the Supreme Court has said, this was not enough, and let's talk about what they did. 
And now let's talk about what this thieving patent troll did in their application. <laughs> you know, they, they had 15 pages, six drawings, no CD-ROM, you know, leaving out the fact that it's not necessary <laughs> to be filed. And, and that can't possibly be enough if this wasn't enough, you know? Mm. And that's going to be a compelling argument in a lot of situations. Now, it's longer argument than that, but, you know. Well, I mean, I think Bob Barr had it right on two counts. The first was, to the examiners, his advice was stay calm and carry on. Right. I but agree. then to applicants, he said, if you are going after a genus or a broad functional claim, you should have a good distribution of your examples throughout the scope of that genus. Right. And I yeah. think that's the kind of takeaway lesson for practitioners out of this. But I do agree with you that there is a very high likelihood that this issue will add to the expense of patent litigation because yeah. now you have another quarter of a million dollars spent in litigation deciding the factual question of was the description good enough for the scope that you're going after which is why I think means plus function comes even more that, to the front. That's what I was going to ask you. Is means plus function the solution to get over Amgen? Well, what it does is you don't have to do as many or as much of a genus feel to the claiming because I got the function there. And I can get a little bit better traction with the jury because if I've used an accumulator rather than a multiplier and I disclosed multiplier but not accumulator, but I have means for adding up, the jury will see those two as the equivalents that they are without you having a lot of Markman claim construction issues to go through. You'll have hoops to go through the Markman and identify the structure and figure out their equivalents and timing of all of that. So there's extra expense on the litigation of the means plus function claims and you don't dismiss that. Right. But in this case, I think that that gives you or gives the potential litigating team an opportunity to at play out multiple different cards right. or multiple different right. hands. Right. So John, thoughts on that before we wrap up here? Yeah, you know, Amgen, I, because reading the case, uh, it, it, there's really nothing to see here, but I am mindful that I felt the same way with Alice that uh, because in it, you know, they said, be mindful, this could swallow all of patent law if you get rolling with this. And so they, they almost, they gave an admonition not to do this. Right, but that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. And so with Amgen, they're saying, look, you, you know, just populate your genus a bit more and, and we'll have another look at it. Um, and so, you know, what's the effect of Amgen going to be? Well, the immediate effect is an awful lot of patents out there with genus claims that are no good. Okay, so that, that's number one. Your portfolio just fell in value because you thought you got the scope of your genus because that's what the claim said. Well, as it turns out, that's not quite what happened, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then you have a lot of specifications that are pending right now that aren't written to this standard. So th these are the immediate things that are going to happen. Uh, what's going to happen going forward, I think, is you're just going to have to have more thoughtful specifications. I thought Bob Barr saying, you know, populate your genus is, is great advice. Uh, but the days of saying, you know, here's a map around the lake, uh, proceed to the lake, turn left, keep the water on your right. That's not, it? Not That's enough. it. You want to go around the other way? Proceed to the lake, turn right, keep the water. <laughs> 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 that, that's your map of the lake. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, no. Oh. We're not going to let you have that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you're probably right. I mean, in, in the Amgen conversation, that's a different conversation. We'll have, we'll have that. I just wanted to see whether you guys thought that maybe means plus function might be a way around it. And because I thought, and I've written, that um, back in the day when things were going all wrong with Alice, that means plus function may be a way to both claim to the limit of what you've gotten your specification and also they're necessarily say and I'm not claiming any more because you can't you can't capture any more than what you've disclosed so you, like the the breath the after invented invention breath well, is not a problem you can still do that under doctrine of equivalence of a means plus function claim 
right. as long as you didn't have to amend it, which right. tends to, you may actually, in prosecution, have less need to amend a means plus function than a specific right. structural No, exactly. Things. So I think some of those types of strategies might wind up being answers in the short term. And who knows what's going to happen in the long term. But the thing that did really surprise me was um, when the um, all these companies that have the same types of patents in their portfolio are going after Amgen. You know, and it's like, it, this has <laughs> bugged me when the Silicon Valley companies were doing it with Alice is you spend in the Silicon Valley area, you know, they, they spent a lot of money lobbying Congress. Okay, now, for those who aren't aware, a lot of money lobbying Congress is not really a lot of money. I mean, it may be, they may have spent a million dollars, you know, lobbying the AIA, and that's a lot of money to spend lobbying, but you're spending a million dollars to then destroy your own patent portfolio because your pat your own patent people have been getting stuff to this that other standard well and i think that was the misguided part of the the cheerleading for the p tab and all that well it's everyone else's patents that are going to be torn up and yeah. then you realize the gun is now being pointed at you and you go wait 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 yeah. wait that's not <laughs> who we, turned that around so yeah, I, what I just happened? i wonder where and this is something that i, I Dan, going back years now i was talking with ray nairo about like what, what we need is we need the shareholders to get involved and figure out that the stuff that they're doing to lobby the, the patent laws are diminishing the value of their own portfolios. And it's a hard sell in some ways because of the way that it gets accounted for on the books. Uh, and, and that's a fun, it's a, the booking keeping is a funny issue. Uh, you, you account for stuff you buy differently than the stuff you create yourself. So you don't, there is no real value to the stuff that you create yourself until and unless there's a transaction. And so that's how I think that these companies have gotten away with saying, oh, well, our patent portfolio really doesn't have a value because we don't use it, we don't sell it, we don't enforce it. But that's just not true. <laughs> that's no. not true. No. But the other thing is for companies like the high-tech companies who are in a space where you have thousands of innovations perhaps in a single device like a mobile phone. They took a look and say, well, we've invested $10 million in our patent portfolio, but we have 20 lawsuits out there for which we've got a budget $5 million a piece for each lawsuit. That's 100 million versus 10 million. Which should I do? Protect the portfolio or decrease my litigation expenses because I'm getting sued on so many patents for all the components in this high-tech device. So there's some logic behind that as well yeah. that puts that camp of shareholders in the patent yeah. system on a different footing than right. you find with the pharma and biotech folks where, with the exception of genus claims, you normally are able yeah. to get a good claim on your product. So, you, you know, we're going to have to have you guys come back to talk <laughs> about that because it is a very interesting uh, issue because there's been, um, you know, back when, before Yahoo became sort of unfortunately irrelevant as a, as a company, there were there there are VCs and because investors they didn't, and stuff. They didn't get patents, Gene. Well, no, they, well, they threw away ten they, deals a day. They weren't leveraging. Yeah. They weren't leveraging their patents that they had. And <laughs> these folks, shareholders, were writing to the board and say, "You need to start licensing this stuff mm -hmm. and follow the IBM and the Microsoft path." And that would have generated money. And you know, it didn't happen fast enough. And things, you know, they wound up getting sold as if Yahoo had no value. Do you remember that? Because it didn't. Because except didn't. their investment in. The Japanese company. Well, right. That that was what sold. And the patent portfolio that they acquired, kind of toward the kind, end, it kind too. of went along yeah. with it for, along for with free. It. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, and so there, there. But that's a different conversation for a different day. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate you guys doing this. You know, I, I I didn't know how this was going to turn out, and I didn't have any preconceived notions about this. But I think that this is kind of like I'm a big UFC fan. So at the end of the UFC events, they always have a post show. <laughs> you know, okay, this is the post show. So, so this, I, I will hey. be referring to this as our post show because post I think show. that it was a fascinating conversation. It kind of brought it all together. So, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, when uh, you, you see this, you'll, you'll, uh, I will probably have a, a new hip by that time, <laughs> and uh, I look forward to hopefully meeting you. And maybe you can join us here at IP Watchdog for for another event. And we have our big annual meeting coming up in September, September seventeenth through nineteenth, and that's going to be at the Hyatt Regency Dulles. 
right next to Dulles International Airport. And uh, so check out our program online, and hopefully we'll see you soon. That's all we have for now. Bye for now, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. That went, I thought, really well. That was fun. There you go. See? <laughs> that, was, that was fun. Well, let me...